Blessings everyone and welcome to 4D Trinity. I am Tuesday Mae Thomas and this is our weekly live stream. I'm so excited to have a guest with us here today. This is Dr. Michael McDonald. Welcome Michael. So Thank happy you. to have you here. I'm happy to be here Tuesday. Yay. And Thank we're you. going to be discussing the I Ching. Dr. Michael has written a beautiful book all about the I Ching. He's going to break it down and help us understand this fantastic and phenomenal oracle. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that beautiful uh, introduction. Oh, you're so it welcome. It sets a great mood, doesn't it, and tone for a discussion. Knowledge about me. And tell me now, I Ching or I Ching? Let's start, <laughs> let's start there. That's a good place to start, yeah. <laughs> well, when you see it uh, like I Ching is how it looks, I-C-H-I-N-G, and then that is from what is called the Wade-Giles system of transliteration from Chinese to English. And then that happened first. And so the book kind of became known as I Ching, C-H-I-N-G, and then uh, they, they changed uh, from Wade-Giles uh, to Pinyin, and then all, and so the transliteration is different, and so properly it should be Yi Jing, and and you'll see that sometimes Y I J I N G, um, and then the Chinese pronunciation is Yi Jing. And so you can see that the old Wade Giles, that was one reason they replaced it. It doesn't look like what it sounds like, and um, but unfortunately the public. Uh, got exposed to the word Tao, mm -hmm. T A O, mm -hmm. Tai Chi, yes. instead of Tai Ji, mm. which would be the Chinese way, mm. and then um, I Ching. And so there's a small number of terms that I still use uh, in Wei Giles because the public knows about it that way. So that was a big answer, but actually, there's no short way to go through that. Um, I do call it I Ching, just out of old habit. So no ch, ch it's G, j, j. So it's E, J. Jing. Yeah, Jing. it actually sounds like a J. E, Jing. E, Jing. See, this is already blowing my mind. This is amazing. <laughs> well, it's only kind of a semi-Chinese lesson because to do it really right in Chinese, you have to have the tones and all that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't go that far with it. But my uh, first teacher, Dr. Alan Anderson, um, uh, used the Chinese pronunciation, so I got used to that uh, early on. And I've always been saying Yi Jing. Uh, when you were talking about teachers in the publication of my book, it did make me think of my early years with Dr. Anderson. Now, he's the first one that got me involved with uh, doing consultations. With the, he introduced me to the Chinese Book of Changes in uh, 1970 at uh, San Diego State University. And um, Dr. Anderson was quite a guy. He was the head of the Religious Studies Department. And uh, he was a complete master of Eastern religions and Western, and uh, also philosophy as well. And he just had this amazing speaking style, you know. Uh, a true master of the spoken word. And wise things would actually come out of his mouth all the time. But he had, uh, he loved the I Ching, and for some reason, he, he, all he had to do was read it, and he understood the whole deal. But he was always going, it's an oracle, so let's try it. Does it really give advice is the only thing I really want to know. And so he had a very practical orientation towards it. And then in our study group, we were always doing consultations and keeping track of the answers. And then with Dr. Anderson, um, I was involved in producing an exegetical manual where we compared uh, I Ching with tarot and with astrology mm. uh, on a systematic basis. And what were the, were there correlations? How did you do the comparisons? Well, this again was his project, but I managed it and was the editor. We had a variety of different study projects, but the main one that he liked and that we were just talking about was uh, well, he would go, like, okay, uh, ask the I Ching, what is the nature of the astrological sign Scorpio? Oh. Record the answer, and then what is the nature of the astrological sign Sagittarius? Interesting. And so we got readings, and then we did tarot readings the same way. We would interrogate the tarot about the meaning of um, different 
astrology elements. And so we had the three uh, oracles in dialogue. And then you can imagine how well I learned the I Ching because I was doing these daily consultations. And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, well, through constant use uh, over a period of years, really, um, I don't know if that was his goal, but I certainly ended up, um, you know, memorizing the, the I Ching. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so it's easy for me to go from um, the, the different trigrams and see that now a hexagram is a six line structure in the I Ching. It's the basic symbolic unit. There's 64 hexagrams. And then the, that's like 64 very basic life situations, uh, 64 pillars of significance in a way. Can I can I pause because I have a feeling there might be people watching this that like are like me and you're already speaking in a tongue that is beyond me. Okay. Do you mind if we backtrack a little bit? Because I'm aware then also um, that it's the book of changes as you said. Yes. But what does that speak to? Like it speaks to, and then as you started to talk about the hexagram, so it speaks to these different parts of our life, our or the changes we experience. What does books book of changes refer to? Well, the basic uh, philosophical idea and is that all things change. That the one thing that we do know about this world of ours, um, that can be said uh, philosophically, and nobody ever uh, doesn't accept it right away. Of course you say yes, uh, that's actually true. Things change. Everything changes. Now the question then becomes, is there a pattern uh, to change, and can we adapt to change? Now, the I Ching is meant to be your guide uh, through the changes that you would undergo in life, whatsoever they might be. Now, how can that be? Well, because it's a universal patterns of change. And th that doesn't mean it's abstract. That means you can't do anything else. Uh, in other words, you're a human being, you're going to change like a human being changes. You're a human being, you're in a, a position in life where there's a significance, okay? That's a human significance. You're not the first person that's been in a situation where they, say, feel squeezed or overwhelmed. Um, and then good advice in that situation is good advice to anybody uh, in that situation. Do you see? So it's a little bit like a GPS system. Because significance itself is like the map, okay? That's the 64 hexagrams. And you're somewhere on that map. But wouldn't that be good if you knew? where. And then the consultation is what bridges that and makes it a GPS system and not just an interesting map. So in other words, if I'm feeling overwhelmed, I have a lot of things going on in my life, I am really ready to receive some counsel and some guidance. The I Ching is an appropriate oracle, as you say, to consult to help illumine the path for me and, and help me see perhaps where it is I'm at and what options I have moving forward. Is that... How you yeah. might use it? Yeah, in fact, that's probably the basic question of the aging is how should I adopt to the situation I find myself in right now? Mm. Um, the Chinese, it was not fortune telling for the sake of knowing the future. It was for the sake of being able to adapt to the circumstances and then be able to act uh, productively within those circumstances. Can I just say that is so incredibly powerful? I'm so happy to hear you say that. It, it creates just um, it's just this ripple in my awareness that brings me back because the now is just so vital and I feel on so many different levels the collective is really getting tapped in and tuned into appreciating and understanding and creating learning how to create correct conditions to even perceive you know what is the now to, to redefine it in so many ways but then as we sit in the now and then we're with these experiences maybe of change in life that happened to us it's so interesting because often, yeah, what's going to happen? Or what happened in my past? Why did this happen? But where you're speaking about makes me think about the aging is like, okay, this is what's now, and this is how you can facilitate, you know, supporting yourself in this shift now. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they have a very beautiful um, e explanatory um, philosophy in the aging. And one of the things they say is that when you... Uh, ask a question of an oracle, uh, then the answer comes back like the echo of the question. <laughs> That's so good. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, because it, it's always perfect, but then that's the synchronicity principle. Thank God somebody else is in charge of juggling from moment to moment, because I couldn't do it, but it, you always <laughs> get to the right place. Everything happens of itself. So, uh, and everything, uh, and so the oracular principle is that you are brought to the exact right hexagram at the exact right moment to illuminate that guidance for you. Let me put it this way, they have a, um, a metaphor in hexagram four of the I Ching that explains this. And uh, here the, in hexagram four, the oracle is speaking in its own voice and it's saying, listen, I'm not asking you the questions, you're asking me. <laughs> it's, seriously, that's the judgment of hexagram four. And it says, you know, the young fool is asking me, I'm not asking you. And the first time you ask, I'll give you the answer. But you have to be the right person and able to understand the answer. And so the art of the oracular is in large part the art of understanding the answer when the echo comes back. You can have an intuitive flash right away because what you have is a symbolic representation of your situation. The hexagram four thing I was talking about, the I Ching represents itself as the forester and life is like being in a forest and we're trying to find our path. You know where your path is, I know you do, but lots of times you could have a little help. And so then you go, well, your path is towards a destination, what's your destination, see? So those would be two separate sort of throwing of the coins? Well, what it's saying is that when you are lost in life or in a tangled uh, pathway and don't know quite where to go, then you ask that I Ching is the forester. Okay, the I Ching knows the whole forest. Okay. okay. Ooh, I like you that. You do see that? Yeah. And so, say, illuminate my next step for me, mm. uh, Mr. Forrester. I would like to know where I am in this world of significance right now. I really appreciate what you're saying. Really? Yes. Yes, because I've never had any intrigue or interest, honestly. Like, it hasn't, like, a, I'm a tarot person. Yeah. You know, I'm a Reiki person. And as far as oracles go, it's the tarot, it's the tarot, or different forms of that. And the I Ching just seemed so, it, it almost, you know what, I'm not a math person, and it just seems almost mathematical to me, and so I just had a block towards it. Yeah. But now, the way that you're expressing, you know, a, a deepening at a, a, a the expanse of it, it's it's actually, now, now I want you to throw coins for me, but I know maybe we'll get to that <laughs> a little later. But I, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, this is beautiful. It, you want it to be practical, right? Mm. At least the, the Chinese had a very hard-headed uh, attitude towards the philosophy or something like uh, symbolic guidance. In other words, it, it's, we, we want something that, that corresponds with our life in visible and dramatic ways. And that's one reason why the I Ching is of interest. I know there's a lot of oracles in the world. There's actually been a profusion of oracles in my lifetime because it used to be just astrology, I Ching, and tarot. Uh, but now there's a variety of different oracular practices, and uh, that's an interesting thing. But the I Ching has this unique tradition. The other ones don't necessarily have a 3,000-year-old uh, tradition. Where uh, And it also, it was never driven underground in China. They didn't have Christianity saying this is shameful or don't consort with demons or this kind of thing. Everybody liked doing oracles. And it's almost like their new, their Old Testament was an oracle. Uh, in other words, the I Ching is a, ch a classic of China. It's one of the five classics, mm -hmm. approximately occupying a position a little bit like the uh, Old Testament in that sense. A central uh, scripture with lots of people commenting through the centuries, and it gets passed down. It becomes a very rich uh, tradition. And so you have the advantage of all. And so, in every instance, you would be led right into modes of appropriate action. Because knowledge is for the sake of action. You understand your situation, and then you can act well within it. And so, hopefully, every consultation ends up with that, um, uh, with the question being answered. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Interpretive closure. Interpretive closure. Now, that's a good one. I yeah. love that. 
And so uh, why do you have all the extra stuff on top of the intuitive flash when you're just seeing the symbol and you're reacting to the symbol? It can help to talk with the commentators. They see different sides of things. Sure, yes. And yes. then you're always bringing in more food for your intuition. Yes. Do you see what I mean? Because what really rang your bell on the intuition might not be the first thing that you ran across as you were sort of mulling over. So right away you'd be led into some imagery and you'd be thinking about how to, uh, you know, create your way forward co-creatively. Because now you're in dialogue with a deeper part of yourself as you're thinking it over. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. Acceptance of the Chinese Book of Changes in China has been, uh, like you said, uh, almost entirely free of the kind of condemnation that we got because of Christianity going, uh, demonizing, essentially. They were saying that if you're consulting with spirits, that's demons. And so they didn't have that happening anywhere in China. But like a lot of oracles, uh, we did have a progression uh, through the centuries in China, because originally it was in the king's court, uh, as astrology would be. Because in really olden days, you have to have scribes that know how to read and write and they have to be supported, and there aren't that many places. So you're either a king or a noble if you've got scribes in the first place, and if you've got time for ritual and the refinements of life. And actually, the king originally wants to know king stuff, basically wars, uh, hunts, uh, marriages, and strategies. And so the I Ching was born out of this political context, and actually Western astrology largely was that way as well, except that that oracle was set up to describe personality to begin with. The I Ching was set up to describe any human situation. But uh, the early work with the kings uh, was a little more exclusive. You had I Ching schools, uh, and then schools of interpretation. So they had Taoist uh, schools of interpretation. And then it was because of the Taoists that the I Ching got this deeper metaphysics and was able to describe existence itself. Uh, the Confucians were the ones that were very interested in right action. And they didn't care about any of the other part of it except knowing how to act appropriately in a given situation. And then later the Buddhists came along and Buddhist commentaries added a great deal of uh, mystical beauty uh, to the thing. But uh, as time went forward, then you did have literacy in the general population, and then we entered a period, let's say after the Han Dynasty, where, yeah, you've got I Ching practitioners now on the street corners of every village. Everybody's involved in it, and nobody thinks there's anything the matter with it. <laughs> uh, and they actually do a little more in the direction of fortune-telling, and they like the idea of probing the future. They weren't all that confusion about it. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and then with the, another change, though, was with uh, China entering into the modern period, where they wanted to say, you know, communism and rationalism and uh, all of this, and we're going to throw out all of the classic teachings and stuff like that. And so at that point, you did have some condemnation of the I Ching, let's say around 1900, at the point of the communist revolution. There would be a rationalist counter culture against I Ching, and I also wanted to say that you were right, it spread very much from China. We're talking that I Ching is very influential all through uh, Korea, uh, Japan, uh, all of the Near East, and they had beautiful traditions that developed independently in the different uh, areas, too. When you say that they developed independently, do you mean that the, the I Ching stayed as the I Ching and they sort of crafted their own formulation of it, or that they took that as a foundation and sort of created a whole different oracle from that oracle? Well, that's a terrific question, but yeah, they always have the aging. Is the, if you look at it as 64 hexagrams, it's always the same. Okay. Those are permanent possibilities within binary mathematics. Oh, okay, wait, now, okay, please keep going. This is very exciting to me. Well, why does a computer have the memory of 64? That's exactly why there's 64 hexagrams. Two times two times two times two times two. It can only build out in binary fashion, you see. And so that's the unchanging aging that will never change, but because that, those archetypes are not just numbers, they're Pythagorean numbers, they're associated with meaning, and the aging is a totally self-consistent system of meaning. The meaning we have on one level builds and goes to the next level and is consistent with the next level. It feels with what you're telling me that there's this majesty almost about it, 
that walks with it, that presides with it, and almost what I'm getting right now intuitively, that really holds space for it as a container that it can maintain its integral root system. That's what it feels like. Well, yeah, and I mean, there is something about having the binary basis at the heart of the uh, oracle itself and the, the graphic part of it. You know, you're learning a language, and uh, I'm sure you know that the inner mind, for whatever reason, is a highly symbolic deal. When you have dreams, that's your inner mind talking to you, right? Okay, are dreams symbolic? Yes. So is your inner mind spontaneously uh, speaking to you uh, in a language of symbolism? And um, then you go, well, then I'm a conscious person, and I would like to be cooperating as much as possible. I'd like to be understanding those deeper feelings inside myself that may be symbolic in character. So learning the language of symbolism is a way of saying, I care. Uh, I want to receive this message. I'm a willing partner in this co-creative event. And um, the idea that I tried to bring out in the book I Ching Self-Change is that in China it developed as a way of personal growth, mm. that you would be a contemplative person. Their word for that was Junzi. And uh, but that's basically somebody that is, all you can say is they're learning the language. That is beautiful. They, they do. Thank you so much for all of this information. This is so juicy. I'm sure our community is going to be well served by it. So thank you. And tell us where everyone can reach you. Do you have a website or an email or something you want to share with us? Yes, actually, uh, I did get Eijing Self Change as a website. So it's EijingSelfChange.com. And my book is available on Amazon, uh, either as a Kindle book uh, or as a uh, paperback. Eijing Self Change by Dr. Michael McDonald. By Dr. Michael McDonald. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's so welcome. good to have you here. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you.